Greetings dear aspirants welcome to today's current affairs session on civil superior today we'll be discussing about the state's startup ranking about western disturbances and about operation digital board under our prelims topic and regarding the national policy on electronics year 2019 and the expert committee recommendations for fixing the national minimum wage under our main topic so let's move on to our first prelim topic of the day the state's startup ranking so you need to know which ministry releases this particular state's uh, startup ranking and what are the pillars of this ranking and something about the 2018 ranking so uh, as the name indicates it is the state's startup ranking so startups are now coming up across different uh, states so the center needs to evaluate the state's performance towards uh, organizing and orienting this startups so for this the ranking methodology has come so the first edition was introduced in the year uh, 2018 by the department of industrial policy and promotion under the ministry of commerce and industries so the second edition uh, methodology has been uh, launched recently by the ministry so the second edition has been launched so by the department of promotion of industry and internal trade so this uh, name is often interchangeably used with your department of uh, industrial policy and promotion so this particular uh, ranking aims to rank the states and the union territories for establishing a robust ecosystem for supporting this startups so it is uh, the ranking methodology is based on some uh, seven pillars and some 30 action points so let us see in brief about those seven pillars so it includes a uh, 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 ranking based on the institutional support given by these states to these uh, startups and simplifying the regulations easing the public procurement incubation support regarding the funding support your seed funding your venture capital funding support and also uh, with regards to the uh, awareness and outreach related activities that these states and the union territories have taken towards promoting these startups in their particular states so this is regarding the uh, ranking framework for 2019 and as i already told the ministry is the ministry for commerce and industries you need to know something about the 2018 ranking framework because for the year uh, 2019 the second edition uh, the calculating period uh, would be till june 2019 so uh, it will be near the prelims exam so uh, 2019 is not significant but the 2018 ranking is significant because it was released in december 2018 so uh, there have been some categories introduced by the ministry uh, for this uh, ranking these startups so uh, under be, uh, best performer top performers leaders aspiring leaders emerging states and beginners so there are six categories based on which the states have been categorized and rank so just have a look at these states so gujarat has been the top performer and this was announced by the department of industrial policy and promotion under the ministry of commerce and industry so this is all you need to know about this particular uh, topic let's move on to our uh, next topic western disturbances so uh, western disturbances are often in news especially uh, in relation to its occurrence in north india and also in north western india so let us try to know what are these western disturbances so as the name uh, indicates so it is coming from the western side of the indian country so from it travels from west towards east so western and disturbances in the sense uh, it, it comes in a disturbed form or in a reduced air pressure when it moves towards india so this particular uh, western disturbance is an extra tropical storm that is actually originating in the mediterranean sea in the european continent so uh, with regards to this you need to know something so this is the tropic of cancer and this is the horse latitude or the subtropical high pressure belt now uh, these pressure belts are caused due to the temperature differences that happen on the land masses in this earth so uh, when it is summer in the southern hemisphere so there is a shift of these uh, pressure belts uh, at least 5 degree latitude so this happens at 32 35 degree latitude the pressure belts so there will be a downward shift of 5 5 degree uh, south latitude so this will move downwards now all these extra tropical storms that originate in the mediterranean sea will carry some vapor from a, a vapor or moisture from the mediterranean sea and it will travel across this uh, black sea and your caspian sea here and it will come to india so uh, with a 5 degree southward shift this will uh, come and end towards india so all these moisture laden clouds will travel towards india and it will dump a huge amount of rainfall sometimes it will be associated with thunder storms as well so this is uh, behind these western disturbances so it is an extra tropical storm that generates uh, 
in the Mediterranean region and travels over these countries, your Iraq country, Iran, Afghanistan and Pakistan to enter India loaded with moisture. So this uh, will happen due to the southward shift of these pressure belts. So in India, it mostly happens in the northern region and the northwestern states. So northern states include Jammu and Kashmir, Himachal Pradesh uh, and uh, your Delhi, Punjab, Haryana, northwestern states are your uh, Rajasthan, uh, Gujarat, etc. And to some extent, it will also attack your eastern India and central India. And this generally happens during the winter months from uh, say uh, Jan to uh, April. So you also uh, know these thunderstorms that act, uh, happen in the eastern India. So partly it is because of these western uh, disturbances as well. So the thunderstorms are called Kalbaishaki in uh, West Bengal and uh, it, it, by different forms and names in different states. So, uh, what are the impacts of these uh, western disturbances? So, it will bring mild rain during winter. So, this mild uh, rain is very much beneficial for the rabi crops. Rabi crops are nothing but those crops grown in the winter months in the northern India. So, especially your wheat is grown in uh, as a rabi crop in the northern India. So, this rain is very much beneficial for uh, the wheat crop to grow. And uh, snowfall will happen in the western side of the Himalayas. So, the Himalayas that faces towards India, it will uh, experience snowfall. And uh, you can see a cold wave throughout the region and sometimes there is also rare hail formation. If you see recently, there was news that uh, a huge hail storm happened around uh, the national capital region in Gurugram and Noida. And this thunderstorm will also be accompanied with hailstorm, lightning and strong surface winds during summer. So during summer, there won't be much of moisture. So this will actually lead to uh, dust storms and huge uh, thunderstorms. And uh, their uh, speed is uh, very much uh, high that it will travel around 100 to 130 kilometers per hour. And it will happen all of a sudden. So uh, there have been some extreme events associated because of these western uh, disturbances. What uh, is once uh, was once thought that uh, would be beneficial to the farmers is now actually hampering the movement of the people uh, across north and northwestern India. So there are some uh, quite some incidences because of these extreme uh, weather patterns because of these uh, western disturbances. If you see in the year 2010, the cloudburst cloud burst happened in the uh, Leh Ladakh plateau of the Jammu and Kashmir state. In 2013, uh, the, these western disturbances were the reason for the Uttarakhand floods as well. And in 2014, uh, excessive rain happened in uh, your Jammu and Kashmir, uh, especially uh, Srinagar was almost to be flooded. And uh, the recent news is 2018 where the hail formation happened in the national capital region. And uh, there are also increased incidences of uh, western disturbances. So uh, in the previous years, uh, the uh, news is that uh, either four or five western disturbances would impact uh, north or northwestern India. But now uh, we are seeing the six western disturbances that too within a, a short span of one and a half months. So uh, this is all you need to know about uh, western disturbances. So just try to know where they originate from and which portion of India does it actually attacks. So let's move on to our uh, third prelims topic, Operation Digital Boat. So uh, regarding this topic, you need to know the ministry which actually implements this project and uh, what is the impact area, who are the beneficiaries and where it is being implemented and what is the pedagogy model. So pedagogy is nothing but uh, uh, some term related to teaching, theory of teaching. So we will see what the model actually is. So uh, so this actually uh, pertains something related to education. So your impact area is education. So uh, to be precise, uh, to provide quality education at school level and also at the higher uh, secondary educational level. So the ministry that would implement here is the Ministry of Human Resource and Development, nothing but your MHRD. So who are the beneficiaries? Your uh, schools, secondary schools, higher secondary schools and also higher education institutions are the major beneficiaries under this particular Operation Digital Board. And where it would be implemented uh, at these higher education institutions and also in the primary, uh, secondary and the higher secondary schools. And uh, this uh, particular Operation Digital Board will uh, follow a flipped uh, pedagogy approach. So we'll see what is flipped uh, pedagogy approach. So uh, about this Operation Digital Board, so since it includes a flipped pedagogy approach, uh, that kind of teaching is actually a kind of interactive teaching. So whatever teaching that is happening through the blackboards at present in schools and also in some of the higher education institutions is quite theoretical and a one-way form of uh, teaching. So the teacher just transfers the knowledge uh, by writing on the blackboard and the students absorb, absorb them. So 
uh, it is now time to popularize this flipped learning as a pedagogical approach uh, in order to improve the quality of education in the country. Hence, this operational digital board has been announced by the government. So, it will be introduced all over the country in government and government aided schools. So, if you see schools, even the states are uh, party to this particular uh, project because the state governments administer the state uh, level schools and the uh, some of the central schools would be uh, aided by the center. So, from class 9th onwards at the secondary level and also at the higher secondary level and also in the higher education institutions. So, what are the objectives of this particular uh, project, the Operation uh, Digital Board? First and the foremost is converting the classroom into a digital classroom and making uh, available all the e-resources at any time and at any place to the students so that the students will have uh, 24 cross 7 access to these resources in order to enrich their knowledge and uh, provisioning of personalized adaptive learning and intelligent tutoring by uh, exploiting the emerging technologies like your machine learning, artificial intelligence and also your data analytics. So, these are the objectives that uh, are being aimed by the government under the Operation Digital Board. So, it follows this uh, pedagogical approach of flipped learning. So, as I told a conventional classroom will be a one way where the uh, teacher will actually uh, impart the knowledge to the students. But here in the flipped classroom, the students can have access to the lectures or the resources at their home only. So, they will prepare uh, something about the class that is going to happen tomorrow or in the future in the uh, uh, in uh, beforehand only. So, they will have some idea about the subject. So, they will come to the classroom and have a practical understanding and discussion about that particular lecture or topic that is to be given by the teacher. And uh, again, they'll go back to home and they will uh, again, they can have access to these resources so that it is uh, more or less an interactive uh, kind of uh, teaching. So here even uh, the knowledge level of uh, teachers would also be improved. It's not that they will just keep imparting one way knowledge, even they have to uh, involve uh, very actively. So their knowledge would be enriched as well. So this is the flipped learning uh, model. So uh, where it is going to be implemented as I told in the schools, the secondary schools, higher secondary schools and also in the higher education institutions. So, uh, for uh, the schools and uh, senior secondary schools at the state level, the state government uh, will take care of the budgeting thing which would be aided by the central as well. And for the central level schools, uh, the center would uh, directly aid these uh, center schools. So, nearly 1.5 lakh secondary or senior secondary schools will be covered under the scheme in collaboration with the states and the union territories where the schools are present. And uh, with respect to higher education institutions, UGC, the University Grants Commission will be the implementing agency uh, for this operation digital board in the higher education institutions. So, for uh, the 2 lakh classrooms that is being targeted, the cost would be around 2000. So, this would be implemented as a central scheme as uh, uh, with funding from HEFA, higher education funding agency. So, this is all that you need to know about uh, Operation Digital Board. Just remember which ministry is going to implement this and for higher education institutions, UGC is the implementing agency. So, just try to have an idea about this and what kind of pedagogical approach that it follows. It is the uh, flipped learning uh, model. So, uh, there are also some other MHRD initiatives uh, that has been uh, released towards improving the education uh, and the quality of education at school level and also at the higher education level. So, if you see uh, government has released this e Patshala app where uh, all your uh, book uh, will be available uh, in the e-format and also your Diksha app, then your national repository for open education resources, then your national program for uh, technology enhanced learning and also your EPG Patshala for the postgraduate uh, courses and also we know that the government as uh, the Ministry of Human Resources and Development has uh, introduced this uh, Swayam portal. So, which is a massive online open courses where the students will voluntarily go and uh, acquire a knowledge on a particular topic and also get a certificate for that. So, uh, this topic we covered in one of our Civilspedia classes and also uh, introducing the Swayam Prabha DTH channels to relay uh, the, uh, the education content in the television. So, these are some of the MHRD initiatives that will go along with this operation digital board. So, this will enhance and enrich the interactive uh, learning of both the students and also the teachers. So, that the knowledge is updated and the education that the teachers provide is of a quality uh, manner. So, this is all you need to know about operation digital board. Let us move on to our uh, main topic, the national policy on electronics uh, for the year 2000.
to 2019. So this will replace the national policy on electronics uh, for the year 2012. So it consolidates the foundations for a competitive Indian uh, electronic system design and manufacturing value chain. So this uh, concerns or pertains something about the uh, electronic system design and manufacturing. So this will replace the policy a 2012 policy. So this policy envis envisions uh, positioning India as a global hub for this electronic uh, system design and manufacturing. So how it is going to uh, consolidate India as a global hub? through encouraging and driving capabilities in the country for developing core components including your uh, chipsets and also uh, the government will provide environment for the development of the industry so it will uh, come up with various schemes it will come up with uh, various initiatives and also with funding in order to aid these electronic industries uh, in order to make india a strong uh, global hub for the electronic industries so what are the impact areas that will be covered under this policy is the main thing that you need to know so it will lead to uh, development of this electronic system design and manufacturing and it will enable the flow of investment and technology to this ed ESDM sector and it will lead to higher value addition in the domestically manufactured electronic products and uh, it will also lead to increased uh, electronic hardware manufacturing in the country and also their export because right now we are lacking in export. India wants to consolidate this uh, manufacturing, uh, India as a manufacturing hub and also to uh, encourage the exports from India to other nations and it will also uh, generate substantial employment opportunities by developing the uh, electronic related industries. So what is the target? The target is to achieve an annual turnover of 400 billion dollars by the year 2025. So uh, what are the production targets? So uh, 1 billion mobile handsets are being uh, targeted to be produced by the year 2025 of which 60% of that targeted 1 billion would be uh, for uh, would be the exports. The remaining would be the imports and those uh, value is uh, around 190 dollars. So these are the targets set out under the National Policy for Electronics 2019. So this policy will actually give a roadmap for the government uh, to make improvements in the electronic uh, industry sector. So uh, under this policy the government will come up with various schemes and initiatives. So that will be uh, very much uh, uh, focused towards uh, what, uh, the requirements. So uh, this is a kind of a generalistic policy laid out by the government towards improving the electronic uh, sector, industry sector. So you need to know what are the silent features of this policy. So the uh, it was published in the uh, Public Information Bureau and uh, it has jotted down some uh, 10 uh, silent features. So let us try to see them uh, in brief. So it aims to create an ecosystem for a globally competitive your electronic design and manufacturing sector and uh, by promoting the domestic manufacturing and export in the entire value chain. So it will start from your production towards sourcing your uh, components and towards uh, till your export which will also include your logistics etc. So uh, how it is going to uh, aim that uh, enriching the entire value chain is through pro providing incentives and support. The, so the schemes would be formulated accordingly in order to provide incentives and support. And uh, it will also provide special package of incentives for mega projects which are extremely high tech because uh, right now whatever we are having is a normal technology. So the government also aims to uh, focus and develop and nurture this uh, high tech electronic products. For that government's uh, funding is highly crucial and a government will uh, aim towards funding these high tech projects that will have a huge investments especially your uh, uh, semiconductor facilities, display fabrication etc. And it will also formulate suitable schemes and incentive mechanisms to encourage your new units and also expansion of the existing units by uh, uh, kind of a funding mechanism. So uh, next thing is uh, the policy aims to promote the research and development of these electronic uh, products and electronic industry in India only. So right now a uh, majority of the components uh, R&D is being done outside India and uh, uh, we are just producing it but uh, now we need to change this uh, towards uh, improving India as an R&D hub as well in the emerging technology. So what are the emerging technologies that has been charted under the policy of 5G. So even the current affairs news is that the 5G uh, has to be introduced by 2020. So the government is aiming to introduce 5G technology by the year 2020. So this will also come under this national policy and your internet of things, sensors, your artificial intelligence, your uh, machine learning, your virtual reality, uh, in the field of uh, drones, robotics, additive manufacturing, phototonics, nano based devices. In all these the government aims to come up uh, and do R&D and innovation. 
and uh, this policy has also laid out a special thrust on certain industries so on fabulous chip design industries in medical electronic devices industry automotive electronic uh, industry your power electronics industry and also your strategic electronics industry so this will be useful for your defense this will be useful for your uh, renewable energy so we have our own energy uh, policy and this will be useful for uh, promoting india as an uh, automobile uh, and this will also be useful uh, because the government has come up with uh, the recent Ayushman Bharat scheme. So, uh, providing these uh, medical electronic devices to all those uh, comprehensive health and uh, wellness centers uh, will actually uh, be a big boost to these electronic industries under this policy. And the government also aims to provide incentives uh, towards the skill development and also reskilling of the employees who are presently working in this electronic industry. And as a part of this policy, the government also aims to create a sovereign patent fund to promote the development and acquisition of IPs, your patents in this particular EDSM sector. And to promote trusted electronics value chain initiatives in order to improve the national cyber security because national cyber security is also a very burning topic at the present scenario. So, uh, this policy for electronics will actually uh, help this uh, national cyber security profile as well. So, uh, this is all about the national policy on electronics that you need to know. Let's move on to our next uh, main topic, the expert committee report on determining the methodology for fixing the uh, minimum national wages in India. So, you need to know who is the chairman of this particular expert committee that will be helpful for your prelims point of view and which uh, ministry under uh, uh, this particular uh, fixing national minimum wage comes. That will also be helpful for your prelims and uh, something about the tripartite bodies. What are tripartite bodies and uh, the guiding principles uh, behind fixing this national minimum wages and what approach does it follow? It basically follows an evidence-based approach to fix the minimum national wages and what are the recommendations of this particular expert committee. So, let's uh, go inside the topic. So, this particular uh, fixing national uh, minimum national wages uh, committee is, uh, has been formed under the chairmanship of Dr. Anup Satpati. So, he's a fellow under V.V. Giri National Labor Institute. And the ministry that uh, deals with this is the Ministry of Labor and Employment. So, this particular ministry has constituted an expert committee in the year 2017 January and uh, exactly after two years the committee has come up with its recommendation and it has been put up in this uh, ministry's website. So, now it will go for uh, consultations amongst the stakeholders. So, it will be your industries, corporates, your government, state government, your central government, etc. So, the purpose is to review and recommend the methodology for fixing your national minimum wage. So, it has been published as I told uh, for uh, the stakeholders uh, comments. So, uh, you need to know something about the tripartite bodies. So, tripartite, tri is three. So, it will basically include your government, your employer, so the companies, employer is nothing but the companies and the employee. So, they can be represented either individually or through unions. So, this is called a tripartite body. So, all these are tripartite bodies. So, uh, this is a very old tripartite body in India, the Indian uh, Labour Conference. We also have the Standing Labour Committee, the Committee on Conventions, the Industrial Committee, which are the major tripartite bodies that are uh, working in India. And we also have other bodies of tripartite nature, your steering committee on wages, your central implementation and evaluation machinery, your national productivity council, your central boards on workers education. So, just have a look at this from prelims point of view, just to uh, give an idea of what tripartite body is. So, uh, because uh, their comments is very much essential because uh, they are the uh, ultimate people who are going to gain at the end uh, by fixing this national minimum wage. So, uh, what are the guiding principles based on which this uh, national uh, minimum wage fixation has come up with is the 15th Indian Labour Conference uh, of 1957 and it has also taken the uh, Supreme Court judgment of Workmen versus the Reptacos Breton Company case in the year 1992 and also the Central Advisory Board on Minimum Wages where the Central Government constituted an expert committee report in order to fix the minimum wages. So, this particular uh, fixing mini national minimum wage is based on a evidence based approach. So, you need to have some evidence that uh, why we are fixing uh, this much particular amount uh, uh, as a, na a minimum national wage. So, uh, it is based on the changes in the demographic structure, nothing but your population, 
based on the consumption pattern of the people or uh, the working force and what are the nutritional intakes, the food based expenditures and the composition of food baskets. So what kind of foods they actually eat and also their non-food consumption items. So we'll be seeing in uh, detail what are their food related expenditures and also their non-food related expenditures. So uh, now uh, we'll discuss the recommendations of this particular Anup Satpati committee on fixing the national minimum wages. So it has come up with many recommendations. I will be discussing some 7 to 8 important recommendations here. So based on these recommendations, you can give your critical analysis. You can give your pros and cons uh, of these uh, uh, particular recommendations. So uh, the first recommendation by the committee is that the changes in population composition happens over time. So uh, uh, they, uh, this particular committee uh, recommends to increase the previously established three consumption units per family to 3.6 units in order to calculate the minimum wage. It is nothing but in a family initially it was considered that only three people will be living in a family. So for that three people the national minimum wages have been fixed. Now the committee recommends to increase this three units per family to 3.6 units per family. So this is recommendation number one. And uh, uh, the second recommendation is the national minimum wage should be able to meet a working family's minimum required expenditure on both food and also on non-food, which should be adequate to preserve the efficiency of workers at their job and also the health of the family. So whatever minimum national wage that the government is uh, giving to these uh, or ensuring to these workers should meet uh, the efficiency of the workers in their job and the health of their families at the end. So this is what the recommendation tells. So based on this, they have come up with fixing the minimum national wages. So they have discussed at large uh, uh, with regards to the food based expenditure. So uh, this recommendation base uh, is focused on a balanced diet rather than mere calories intake. So initially when the national minimum wages were fixed, it was just based on the calories intake. But now they want to focus on a balanced diet because your calories co can come from your carbohydrates, it can come from your proteins or it can come from your fats. So initially uh, when it targeted only the calories, the calories can also come only from carbohydrates so that your proteins and fats can be left out. Now this uh, committee's recommendation uh, focuses uh, recommended daily intake of 2400 calories uh, which should include a minimum 50 gram of protein and minimum 30 gram of fat. If you see for carbohydrate uh, it is uh, 4 calories, for proteins it is 4 calories per gram, calories per gram and for fat it is 9 calories per gram. So at least um, uh, recommended daily intake is 2400 calories uh, uh, for an uh, adult person per day. So this should include at least minimum 50 grams of protein and 30 grams of fat. So 270 plus 200. So out of 2400 at least 470 calories should be sufficed by these proteins and fats is what the committee's recommendations. And uh, they have also taken some inputs for calculations. They have told that uh, you cannot uh, keep uh, the inputs uh, at a very stagnant level. So it should be a dynamic input. So it should make utilize uh, make utilize these consumer expenditure survey of the national sample survey office and also it should all also accommodate the changes in the prices at least every six months on the basis of the consumer price index which is made available by the central statistical office. So uh, the inputs for uh, deciding uh, the calculation should be a very dynamic one is what the recommendation made by the committee and they have listed uh, non uh, food expenditures as uh, essential non food expenditure and the non essential uh, non food expenditure so uh, essential non food items are your clothing fuel and light house rent education medical food wear transport so uh, based on this uh, the national minimum wages have been fixed and other uh, essential non essential non food items are your entertainment, durable goods, toilet articles, other household consumables, your consumer services excluding your uh, travel and also your consumer taxes. So uh, based on this, uh, the value that has been fixed by the committee is rupees 375 Indian national rupee uh, per day as of July 2018. Now, as I already told, this committee also recommends that the inputs for calculation should be dynamic. So when they are fixed, they are fixed for July 2018. So the government can also take the uh, dynamic inputs for increasing this uh, uh, minimum national wages. So for a month, there would be 26 working days. So this would amount to 9,000. Uh, 750 per month irrespective of the sector in which the workforce uh, works irrespective of the skills 
their occupations and also respective of the rural and urban locations so this national minimum wage will be uniform throughout the country and uh, they have also proposed five regions for fixing uh, different amounts of uh, national minimum wages so uh, these are the five regions so this is region 1 which will include most of in eastern states uh, including your uttar pradesh and madhya pradesh and also uh, your uh, region 2 is your andhra pradesh telangana and uh, rajasthan uttarakhand jammu and kashmir and chatisgarh and region 3 is all your uh, western coastal states and also your southern coastal states of tamil nadu and kerala and uh, region 4 is only those three states himachal pradesh punjab haryana and your national capital region of delhi and uh, region 5 will be all the northeastern states excluding assam so assam will come under your region 1 so why they have given these minimum national wages because uh, the living uh, expenditures might vary in this region more or less it is uniform based on the region if you see uh, delhi punjab haryana they have uh, a very high cost of living so it is uh, very much low in the northeastern states so based on which the national uh, minimum incomes has been fixed just take a look at the value so this uh, you will not need just to uh, give your idea in the exam that why uh, region wise classification has been done. You can either uh, give a, a positive point on this uh, recommendation or also you can give your a negative point or point for improvement on this recommendation. And there are also some other recommendations made by the uh, committee. So uh, it has uh, asked for a compensatory rent, uh, rent allowance over and above this national minimum wage at a rate of uh, rupees 55 per day so per month it will amount to 1430 so uh, per month already uh, they are uh, uh, recommended a uh, national minimum wage of rupees 9750 plus this 9750 plus this uh, rent allowance and uh, this rec uh, committee recommendations have also told that this uh, national minimum wage will uh, no way uh, have any link with the paying capacity of the employees. So based on which the companies cannot tell, they'll pay only the national minimum wages. So based on the worker skills, based on the work type, the company is liable to pay a, 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 a wage that is also higher than the national minimum wages. And uh, the uh, committee also tells that further research is required to arrive at any productivity link revisions. And the recommendations have also called for creation of a research unit in the Ministry of Labor and Employment towards uh, working this national minimum wages since uh, the committee has recommended that uh, the inputs for calculating the national minimum wage should be a dynamic one. For this a uh, huge amount of research and development is required right now the data is very much scattered so a uh, research uh, unit will help towards addressing these problems and uh, the government uh, the uh, committee has also uh, asked for uh, 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 also, also recommended uh, to have a minimum wage campaign in order to increase the awareness of all those uh, labors uh, in order to know about their national minimum wages. So these are the recommendations made by the Anup Satpati committee on fixing the national minimum wages in India. With this we are winding up our today's topic. Please do like, comment and share the video and please subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy channel for latest videos and updates. Stay focused and motivated friends. Thank you.